So we are in the cockpit of my kayak and I'm going to talk about the uh, projects I uh, added for this year. One big and one uh, fairly simple, but uh, from a safety point of view, uh, uh, fairly important. Uh, the, the simple one was I carry this uh, air horn uh, in the boat the last few years uh, in case of uh, I need to warn somebody, of a, particularly of a collision, and I've seen videos where there just isn't time to to hunt for stuff, and in my case, this tended to get kicked around the bottom of the boat and go under things, and I wanted to give it a nice uh, location where it would always be available to me. So on my uh, tool caddy, I uh, just looked for a place I was going to put it and decided to uh, use the uh, carrying handle, which is uh, this right here, uh, which uh, when I'm normally having it in the boat, I'm not using it for anything. So what I did is I 3D printed a... Uh, adapter that snaps into that location and then a, uh, a holder for the uh, air horn and uh, finally the air horn fits fairly snugly in there and so that's uh, been sitting there all season long uh, available for me to hit the button if uh, I should need to and uh, it's, it's printed in white because uh, you don't want to let the uh, compressed uh, gas overheat. And uh, the times I checked it uh, during the early part of the season when the sun was a lot hotter, it was staying at reasonable temperature all the time. So uh, it wasn't, uh, didn't seem to be any issue about it uh, overheating. Uh, but it's, uh, the way it's implemented, it's, it's quite sturdy and uh, uh, should be a reliable uh, place to uh, keep the horn in the future. The big project for this year was an improved Torquedo throttle. Um, the original throttle is uh, this box right here. It's now five years old and as it's aged it started developing a few problems. Uh, the simpler of the two is this uh, membrane power switch which uh, get, works pretty well just to turn it on because you get instant feedback whether it worked or not. To turn it off, you've got to hold it down three seconds, and if you get a little bit off the center, it uh, doesn't work right, and uh, um, a lot of times, especially after a long day, I'll spend 10, 15 seconds trying to get the thing to turn the power off, and that's most of, more or nuisance than anything else, but uh, um, still something I wanted to fix. The bigger problem was in how the Torquedo throttle uh, tr translates movement of the throttle handle uh, into the electronics. Turns out after I took it apart I discovered that on the uh, axle for this handle is a magnet and as you move the handle you're rotating a magnetic field. Then inside of the electronics box, which is a, a watertight box, there is an integrated circuit that uh, detects that rotating magnetic field and converts that into a value. Um, I discovered that uh, as I used it more last year, is that uh, it became very insensitive, so you'd make big excursions with the handle for it to be able to see any movement at all, when invariably you'd overshoot what you wanted, and then you'd have to work it back, and you'd kind of have to hunt uh, back and forth to find the throttle position that you wanted. I, uh, the, the part that, uh, that they used is a commercially available part, although it's no longer in production. But I did find one in China for 20 bucks, and so I replaced the part that was on the circuit board. And it improved things for a little while, but that one went bad pretty fast too. So my theory is that as those parts age, that they uh, develop a problem. And uh, um, it's uh, just something that was in the design. So I wanted a solution that would give me a very precise, repeatable throttle. And... Uh, that uh, led me to uh, designing my own throttle box, which is uh, this guy right here. And thanks to Sam Seifert and his blog post, Hacking Torquedo Outboard Motors, which gave me the push to start this project, and I included a URL to his blog below. Um, I'm going to put up a still picture that shows uh, labels and all, all, all these switches and lights, uh, which, as you can see, I did not implement. Uh, but... Uh, it's a fairly simple device uh, in terms of function out from, from a user point of view, but there's a fair amount of complexity inside. So uh, let's uh, turn it on, and the first thing is my own new power switch, which is a big recess switch on the side, 
uh, and just push that in, things turn on. Um, and it, uh, with this uh, mode switch in the center position or the off on the label, um, the box really isn't doing anything except for filtering extraneous values coming out of the Torquedo throttle, which is also one of the failure modes that uh, I discovered last year. I'd be motoring along and all of a sudden, I, and every few seconds I'd hear a, a kind of a burp sound and I feel, I'd feel a slight change in g-force and as I discovered as I started looking into this stuff is that the uh, magnetic sensor would throw out uh, bogus information every few seconds which would then cause the motor to interpret that as needing to make a speed change. So when the switch is off I filter out those bogus uh, values and uh, get rid of that uh, those uh, burps in the uh, engine. Uh, normally I use it in the throttle mode which is uh, with the switch down and in that position the uh, the two boxes work in tandem with each other. Uh, first the the big handle uh, takes precedence over anything I'm doing in my box uh, so if you uh, first of all you have to move the big handle to a forward position for my box to to uh, allow it to enter in the, into the throttle control. If you move the big handle to stop, it immediately stops, uh, irrespective of what position this one's in. Uh, if you're in reverse, um, my box uh, doesn't interfere with anything that's going on in the reverse mode. So the Torquedo throttle has a dead man switch, which is, which is a magnetic uh, sensor that normally is tied to my uh, PDF. Um, since I don't have that on me right now, I'm going to use this just plain old magnet. And uh, right now, it's noticing there's an underscore next to the uh, power information, and that's indicating that there's no magnet. So if I was to uh, 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 put it in uh, in into uh, turn the throttle on, you notice that the underscore went away, and uh, the because uh, the magnet is engaged, and it would turn the motor over if I had left it. Uh, the throttle open uh, very long. So let's go back to uh, without the magnet so I can manipulate the throttle without causing any problems. So in throttle mode um, what you're doing is uh, you're using uh, adding this little rotating switch which is a 16 position uh, encoded switch with detents for each position and with each uh, detent uh, from one to the other you're adding a small value to the throttle and it uh, goes up and it goes down and won't go below a certain value uh, where uh, the throttle, where the engine would stop. If you want to stop it, you've got to use the, the big handle. Um, and it gives you very precise uh, control of the engine this way. Uh, in this mode, the set uh, position uh, sets the current, current value. You can say, want to speed up because you're avoiding something or trying to get someplace quickly and then hit resume and it goes back to the, the previous value. The second, and this is the mode I use most of the time, uh, about the only time I didn't use this mode was in gusty conditions um, where being a light boat with very little power uh, the wind has a pretty big effect on your speed and when you're trying trolling, especially when a big gust comes along, you don't want your uh, tackle to drop to the bottom and get snagged on something. So the cruise control mode is what I use under windy conditions. Um, and like on a car, it uh, you uh, set your current speed and uh, it will then uh, maintain that speed uh, uh, based on uh, one of two speed sensors. Um, since we're I don't have the uh, magnet on, um, it's not going to actually uh, engage the cruise control also we're running at zero miles per hour which is also prevented from engaging it. But if I hit the set it would remember whatever the current speed was above zero and then uh, each uh, detent on the knob increases your speed by a tenth of a mile an hour uh, and the other direction decreases by a tenth of a mile an hour. So set and resume again like uh, on your car. Um, and I found in winning conditions this was very helpful and uh, I'm glad I implemented it. But normally, uh, just having the throttle was, was more than adequate. Um, I mentioned uh, one of two speed sensors. There's an icon uh, just to the right of the M there, which indicates which of the two speed sensors 
either high or low, high meaning GPS and low meaning uh, a paddle wheel sensor. So uh, I just switched it to off mode, which changed the function of this switch. Uh, we'll go back to cruise, and if we were actually moving, the uh, paddle wheel sensor would then be supplying the cruise uh, control with the speed that it would try to maintain. Uh, I found this the cruise was, uh, or this paddle wheel sensor was, uh, when it was very clean, it was good at normal trolling speeds. Uh, as it got dirtier with all the scum that's in the Salusla, uh, it became pretty inaccurate uh, below two miles an hour. Above that, it was fine. And if I was trolling uphill, it was fine because it was you got more water going over the over the paddle wheel. Um, there's a separate video just talking about the paddle wheel, um, which uh, shows you how it, how it was uh, set up and what it looks like. Overall, I'm very happy with this project. Uh, I say I used uh, it entirely through the season. Um, I should also mention there was a, there's one other light here, which is the fault light. I built uh, extensive uh, hardware and software fail-safe uh, detection and uh, correction. Um, I was worry, really worried when I started this project that it, I might get in a mode where I made the uh, motor inoperable, and I was determined uh, to prevent that at pretty much all costs, although the cost was in terms of a few dollars in parts. Um, but there is hardware detection. Um, when the box powers up, um, uh, it is disconnected from the uh, being in the circuit with the uh, with the motor, and not until it finds that everything's correct does it engage itself and turn the red light off. If it ever should have a uh, hardware detected failure or a software failure, either one, it will uh, engage that circuit. Light will come on, and uh, it will use a, a relay to disconnect. Uh, this box here from the circuit completely, so uh, it ha can have no, as long as that relay is open, it can have no interaction on the motor. Um, after a full season of using the box, plus extensive testing uh, after it was originally built, uh, I've never seen a failure that would cause that uh, after I got all the software bugs out. And so I'm uh, quite happy with the robustness and uh, I was glad the fact that it never, never saw the fail safe engage. So now I'm going to move on to uh, how uh, I implemented this, both uh, electronics and the uh, 3D printed of the packaging. I implemented my throttle uh, on this little board right here, the design of which was uh, driven by how Torquedo did their throttle design. They used 3.3-volt uh, logic, which was powered by a 5-volt unregulated power supply that I've seen range from 4.5 up to 6 volts. So I needed a 3.3-volt uh, uh, microcontroller, and all, my logic also had all run on 3.3 volts also. So what I went with was a uh, Arduino uh, Dua 3.3-volt uh, processor. Uh, I had 40 I.O. pins, so... Uh, Plenty of I.O. Uh, on, just like Omega has. Um, so plenty of I.O. pins uh, to do what I needed to do with plenty to spare. Um, I connected the 5-volt uh, unregulated to the 5-volt rail of the uh, DUA. The only thing that actually runs directly off of 5 volts is the, the chip that does the USB interface. And it was it's rated up to 6 volts. So it's been happy uh, running off the unregulated supply and then the do uh, generates 3.3 off of uh, the unregulated 5. So on top of the DUA is uh, my uh, daughter card that uh, you can see is a hand-built board. Um, very low frequency uh, signals are being uh, utilized on this board so a printed circuit uh, board wasn't necessary plus everything I needed to do easily fit in the space I had so I didn't need to worry about service mount. Um, almost all the board, everything in this area, uh, majority of that is related to the failsafe function. Um, physically quite a few parts uh, but all are quite inexpensive parts uh, so it's only a few dollars other than the relay which is like a ten dollar part but uh, uh, not bad. Um, this uh, Connector over here is for ribbon cable, which is uh, what the uh, 
switches and display are connected to inside the box. Um, the square pin tenor over here is uh, the Torquedo interface and uh, this one here is for the paddle wheel sensor and I also added a, a SD card uh, reader interface uh, so I could do data collection uh, when I was well testing it and uh, operationally. And there's a little ribbon cable on a, with an SD card uh, reader that just drops in the side here and when I want to do data collection. This is all uh, hand built uh, with a, just point to point wiring. Um, took uh, less than a day to build it uh, and it works just fine. The, uh, you've seen the box before, at least the front of the box. Um, it was 3D printed out of uh, PET-G, which is a uh, very water resistant material often used for making water bottles. Um, it has very low uh, thermal expansion. Uh, uh, when you're printing it, you don't have to worry about uh, warping of uh, the print uh, as it's uh, being printed due to the temperature. Um, the only real negative to it is that it tends to be stringy, and uh, so there's a fair amount of cleanup uh, after the printing was done, even though I did work quite a bit on my printer to try to reduce the springiness. stringiness. Um, a couple things you hadn't seen is, is, is there's a couple of uh, inset uh, buttons on the sides. This is the power button on this side, and then on the other side is a, an emergency disconnect uh, button in the red. Um, the switches uh, are all uh, IP67 rated. Um, the uh, boots on the switches, uh, that was without the boots on the switches, I added those for extra measure. The uh, shaft of this rotary encoder uh, was IP67, but they didn't include anything for mounting uh, that was uh, part of their design. So I had to come up with a gasket for this uh, rotary switch uh, that uh, I also 3D printed out of uh, NinjaFlex. Um, the display area, I did a, an inset uh, uh, around where this bezel is, and then on top of the inset, inset glued a piece of plexiglass, and then on top of the plexiglass glued the bezel. As you can see, it wasn't the best gluing job, but it uh, it's not covering up any of the display that matters, and it was watertight. I did do an immersion test on the, at least the face and the switches, uh, but I never did one on the back. So on the back, um, you see they've got the uh, area for cables to come in. Um, originally, I tried doing this box as one piece, but I just couldn't get these connectors to uh, be properly torqued down. Uh, from the underside, so I ended up building uh, this uh, connector area as a separate block of plastic, attached the cables, got them torqued down, and then glued this block onto a shelf that I designed into the, into the housing. Uh, on the inside you can see there's the uh, ribbon cable going to the switches and the display over here. Um, this is the cable that goes to this connector here for the paddle switch, paddle wheel sensor. And this uh, square pin header goes to the uh, Torquedo interface. So the uh, the back of this, as I mentioned, I'd use Ninja, Ninja Flex uh, for a gasket uh, for the uh, rotary switch. Well, the same thing I did uh, here is a gasket uh, that I three D printed for the for the back lid, and it fits like that. And then the back cover. Um, goes in there like, like so, and then it's screwed down to form a good seal. The uh, back cover has was done with a, uh, a ball mount uh, for a, a ram uh, clamp. Um, I'd printed a bunch of these last year and found that uh, they tended to slip when it was just a bare plastic. Uh, so this year I tried something new. After printing this, I then uh, dip the ball in a uh, uh, plastic dip, uh, which is typically used for like tool handles uh, to give you a, a nice grippable surface. And I found it uh, worked uh, quite well for a ram ball. The, uh, it doesn't slip when it's clamped down, and uh, the only real drawback is that it grips it deforms a little bit when it's clamped, so it tends to grip a little bit too well. Uh, if you're trying to move it around, you have to loosen the clamp a little bit more than you normally would for a, a ball. 
uh, or a uh, wall made by uh, RAM. Uh, but that was a minor uh, inconvenience because I didn't, once I got it set up, I didn't typically move it very much. Um, the other thing I found, uh, which is fairly typical with 3D printing, is I originally printed it uh, like this uh, with the layers going up through it. And on the first version, it didn't take me too long to snap off this uh, off the neck uh, because that's where the layers are going up this way. So this one was actually printed uh, with it uh, vertical on the table and uh, uh, made it quite a bit uh, stronger since the layering is up through this way. And then in addition, I printed a, uh, a pilot hole through the through the neck and through into the middle of the ball, and then I put a stainless steel screw, self-tapping screw, right up through the up to the middle of the ball. So it's so it has some reinforcement to give it some extra extra strength. Um, because Pet G is pretty stringy, I did have to sand uh, this uh, this face here and the face the mating face on the the box here to get a a, a good clean fit. So that's uh, it for the implementation. I said earlier, I'm very happy with how, this, how all this turned out. It was a, a long project, but uh, it uh, has pr proven to be worth the time. It's uh, really improved my experience uh, uh, trolling for salmon.